friends and brothers. This is Justin Jones with Masonic Improvement. I'm joined with my co-host, Brother Dennis Yates. How are you doing, Dennis? Wonderful. I, I'm even more stoked because I've got one of my very favorite brothers from, from the Valley. You know, I, I consider him, and, and he doesn't realize this, but I, I really do consider him my mentor on, on Kabbalah. You know, and, and I think many people do, and so it's it's hard for him to really under you know grasp the gravity of that. But uh, friends and brothers, I am so excited to introduce uh, a very good friend of mine and a uh, a member of of uh, my valley at the Scottish Rite, a member of of Alamo Lodge, a member of um, Merritt Lodge, a member of my AMD, as well as. Uh, a member on on and I'm sure there's more memberships out there, but <laughs> as well as as with all of us, <laughs> but he's also a member of the uh, of of the civil law. Yes, in in in, uh, in Grand Lodge, and, and he's vice chair. He has been for he's been a member of of the the committee for years, and and he's very well respected and loved by all of us. Uh, Brother Robert Park, thank you for joining us, Robert. Well, thank you for having me, and I apologize for the uh, eight times or so we've had to move this interview. I'm, I'm happy that it finally worked out. Uh, yeah, I'm Lawyers, happy. I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been looking forward to it. We've never spoken directly. Uh, however, uh, Dennis talks you up quite a bit. So uh, I, I've been, he's usually right about these things, so I've been very excited. Good. Well, yeah, it's good to meet you, too. I, I'm listen to your podcast for a while but this is the first time i think i've actually talked to you in person yes sir very nice well it, he said i listened to your podcast for a while so obviously he quit whenever i joined so. <laughs> <laughs> i listened to both of y'all's podcasts for a while no, I just <laughs> uh brother park let's start off would you tell us a bit about your masonic background sure um i have been a mason for almost 12 years now I'm a past master of Alamo number 44 in San Antonio. I'm a past district deputy grandmaster of Masonic District 39C. I was chairman of the Civil Law Committee last year. I am vice chairman this year. Um, I'm a member of the York Rite. As Dennis said, I am the, uh, the master of Manly P. Hall AMD right now. Uh, I'm Scottish Rite, past venerable master of San Antonio Lodge of Perfection. Uh, currently, I'm the chairman of the San Antonio Scottish Rite Library and Museum. And a member of all these other various organizations, um, you know, there's too many to name, but yeah, those are my main Masonic points. And um, my grandfather was a Mason. He was a member of Washington Lodge in Dallas. My great grandfather was a Mason there, and they were both Scottish Rite Masons. So I come from a long history of that. I, I think I, I kind of know the answer to this, but I usually get surprised in some way. Why did you join Freemasonry? Well, that is a uh, that's a good question. So, I'd always heard about Freemasonry from my grandfather, um, but you know, growing up, he would talk about it, and I saw his, um, you know, he had a Shriner hat in his office, so I always saw that and the other things he had there, and I would ask him questions, and he'd tell me some things, but really never got into it. And you know, I didn't know anyone else who was a member. You know, I went through high school and through college, didn't meet anyone else who was a Mason. I didn't know much about it in law school. I became friends with a, a guy who was a member of Alamo Lodge, and he's the one that first started talking to me about it. And once I started looking into it, I got very interested because when I was in college, I was an art history major, and I specialized in classical Greek and Hellenistic art, and I knew a lot about the various classical mystery cults. And when I learned that Masonry claimed to be a successor in thought to those groups, that really got me interested. And so I went down there and started meeting with the guys at Alamo. And um, I was lucky. At Alamo Lodge, there were a lot of people who really liked the esoteric side of masonry. And so it was like perfect timing. I got there and started talking to these guys. And I was like, wow, this is, this is what I was looking for. I'm going to give this a shot. And it was just you know very fortuitous circumstances that brought me in there. And that's kind of how I got into it. I had the family history, but my dad wasn't a mason. Like there's a lot of people from the boomer generation who their parents and their grandparents were Masons, mm -hmm. but for what reason they decided not to get into it. So he never told me anything about it. And so I kind of found this out for myself and then learned that I had a rich Masonic background with my family later. Wow. 
Yeah. Which which mystery schools did you find the connections with? Well, <laughs> to, to be honest, I was a uh, my thesis was on Dionysian art and archaic Greek pottery. Which um, it, for a time there, I wanted to be a curator, which did not work out for various reasons. Um, so I studied that. Um, I knew the uh, the mission of Eleusis. I knew some of the other ones, uh, and I was always um, a little upset that those had vanished. When you read about it, they kept the secret so well. We know some things about those groups, you know. But once they once they were destroyed, you know, very few actual things tra uh, got down to us, and so. And I, I wish there was something that we had right now that kind of you know, took that tradition. I didn't know much about the esoteric tradition at that point when I was. I was like, I wish we had something like that still today. Mm -hmm. And so when I found out about masonry, that's what really got me into it was there was some link there that, you know, I might learn what they were actually doing in these groups. Of course, it's a lot different. Like, that's what I was thinking at the time. Once you get into it, you kind of learn, like, you know, what was really going on there. But that's what drew me in, in the first place. Interesting. I remember several years ago, I don't remember where it was anymore. I know it was online, but I was, I was looking up, I think it was something about the catechisms and it was like a old version of the catechisms. And I don't think it was from Texas. It might've been from like the UK or something, but uh, the general, the general question was, you know, where do we originate? And the answer was uh, the Dionysian artificers. Yeah. So, uh, when you said that, that rang that bell. I mean, you maybe remember it immediately. It's very interesting. I, well, I, I really, I really like that link. There were a lot of similarities, like superficially, when you look at it. In a lot of these groups, you would have circumambulations. You would have the presentation of certain objects that were explained to you. You know, there would be different like degrees or different levels of the stuff. There would be a myth of a quote unquote dying god that was resurrected. There were all these things. If you look at the structure of masonry. Like you can see, okay, we're looking at this structure. This stuff kind of fits. They're doing the same type of thing, or they're presenting the information in the same way. And I think you know that when masonry says it's a successor to these things, you know, knowing what I know now and not then, I would say, in that way, we're the successor. We teach these things in the same way that these groups taught things through symbolism, through allegory, through these same procedures. And um, you know, it, there are striking similarities between that. But those things weren't secret. Like, you know, everybody knew basically the forms and ceremonies of a lot of these groups. We just didn't know exactly what they did in them. Yeah. Yes. What 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 I love about that this this topic right here is that number one, we speculate on on, you know, a lot of of what actually came from them and what didn't. And and we expanded on a lot of things. However, for me, it, it it proves in my mind that while we took some of the working tools from the the um, the actual bricklayers of the day, we took the speculation a little bit further back, and we just we just put the two together. It, it was never just a continuation of of. Uh, <laughs> of the of the Masons Guild back in the in the in the uh what is that the the 13th 13th century or 12th century 11th century it was never really so in my mind we always it was always put together as speculative once it became once we started freemasonry it was always added in to create that that um that mystery that wouldn't have been there otherwise. You're, you're right. And that was one of my big things when I first joined. I wanted to figure out, like, what was our link to these groups? Like, where did this stuff come from? And you can you read a lot of things. Like, you read different Masonic authors, and they will have different explanations. But, you know, after doing research, and I, I'll butcher this by trying to, to do it quickly, but I gave that presentation at AMD once on the origin of the master's degree. But from what I've learned so far... It, it seems like what happened is, you know, you had, um, I'm not going to go all the way back, but you had the Hermetic Revival during the Renaissance. So you had all these ideas mm -hmm. that were Hellenistic and you had, you know, Jewish Kabbalah. It came in, like the Medicis were translating these documents. They wanted to translate Plato, but they found, you know, these Hermetic documents. And they translated those. 
and it caused kind of an uproar. And for a while, even the Vatican was decorated in hermetic symbolism. So you had this merger right then of all these different ideas, kind of like what happened in the Alexandria in the Hellenistic period. You had all these different currents coming together, forming something kind of new, which I, I, you know, I don't want to call Christian Kabbalah, but basically a Christianized hermetic Kabbalah. And then, you know, that led to, you know, Rosicrucianism, and that led to all these groups kind of going through Europe right there. And so in the, you know, in the 1600s, it was ripe for these people to take a operative group like the Masons and kind of co-opt it. Say, so we, we have this group right here that's already organized. They're, they're already secretive. They have these passwords. They have everything else. Why don't we get into this group and inject this stuff into it? So it, it seems to me you had this pre-existing group, and then you had this group of people who were into this sort of thing, like Elias Ashfall, we call him the first speculative mason. Yes. You had all these guys who were members of the Royal Society, who were members of these Kabbalah clubs and these Rosicrucian groups, and they got into masonry and injected this stuff in there. And those were the guys who wrote the degrees, or the master's degree. Those were the guys who put our ritual in the way it is now. So it, <laughs> I use this metaphor even though it's probably not the best one but it's like operative masonry was a cell and these guys were a virus and they came in and injected themselves <laughs> in <a> <laughs> but i you know, that's absolutely true and i don't think that's so far-fetched because not to not to go off on a tangent here but i think that's kind of what happened in the 1950s uh with our approach to freemasonry was you had outside ideas that come in and kind of kind of changed a changed the course of, of where we were going so I, I don't think that's outside the realm of possibility for something like that to happen. Yes. So out of the many, many theories I have heard, that one strikes me as believable. Mm -hmm. uh, but the most plausible, yes. Yeah. But when you get to like, you know, the legend of the craft and tracing this stuff back all the way to, you know, Adam, like it's like they say in some of these like like Mackie, like it might not be literally true. But there is some truth to it, tracing these thoughts through these different regions. Like the thing might not be true, but there is some value to this to see how these thoughts made their way across the world in different cultures. And it's just interesting for that, because once you go back to the Hermetic Revival, you can go back further than that. Where did this stuff come from? And you, you go back to basically, like I said, in Alexandria during the Hel Hellenistic period, you had Eastern thought coming in, you had Jewish thought, you had all this stuff, you know, just mixing right there. And so you can trace that back even further, but you know when you start laying that stuff over the legend of the craft, it makes a bit more sense in a symbolic way, I guess. <laughs> yes, it's a yes. nice compromise, in my opinion, because yeah. you, you have two schools of thought. Usually, they have the people that think we came from the stones, the stone guilds, and it just just originated strictly from that, and then you had the people that believe that we came strictly from uh, like the mystery schools. This is almost like a blend of the two, where people were influenced by. The mystery schools or the or the ancient teachings and, and they combine that with an existing organization to create something something new and that that's my viewpoint it's kind of like what pike said he said that you had a lot of people in the past who were masons and he would say they're not masons like they were made a mason but they're masons for the way they thought like the things they believed in the way they taught them made them masons mm -hmm. and that's i think when we say like this guy was a mason or this figure was a mason Sometimes I take that in the, the Pike sense, that he was a Mason in what he believed and the way he taught it. And if you, if you do it that way, I think it just, to me, everything kind of falls into place. Yeah. Well, and, that, and that's kind of what happened when, when I joined Scottish Rite, is that I realized that, well, what I felt inside was validated. Because in reality, what it does is it tells us to open up our mind and realize that all these different schools have have uh similar similar flavor to them and we shouldn't discount any of them as as not being a part of freemasonry and and so that's that's why i was all in as soon as as soon as i met y'all i was all in because well, of that yeah, very reason that is why the vast majority of my masonic efforts are put into the scottish rite uh, i i love yes. this i love every I don't want to say I don't like you know other groups. <laughs> uh, I, I love the Scottish Rite. That is the place that I like to be. Awesome. Brother Part, uh, if you would please tell us uh, how did the reality 
of Freemasonry compare with your expectations when you joined? Well, <laughs> I didn't really have many expectations going in. I, I really didn't know what to expect. I didn't do much reading on it when I got in. I, I was just kind of listening to the guys at Alamo. I, I suppose the one thing I was disappointed with when I first went through the degrees and after I started working, and I, I will tell you, uh, one of my favorite Masons in the whole world is my mentor who taught me the work, Ron Havens, who is the secretary of uh, Alamo 44. Uh, but when I would ask people about the um, the esoteric aspects of the symbolism, or what does this mean, or where did this come from, um, you know, no one seemed to know much about that, and that bothered me at the time. But I will tell you today, that doesn't bother me very much. And again, I had a particular expectation. I was going in kind of looking for the esoteric aspects, like some people do. But once I went through the chairs and became a more mature Mason, I realized that is not the only side of Masonry. And nor should it be. Yeah, again, I think masonry exists for many, many different purposes, for fraternal purposes, you know, philosophic, historical, civic, you know, integrative purposes. The esoteric is only one side. And I don't expect all masons to be passionate about it. And I really don't think they should. You know, I, I just once I've learned more about masonry, I think masonry is much better being somewhat amorphous without any like dogma or theology or like this is what we do. You know, this is what these symbols mean. We are an esoteric group. I think if we tried to do that, we would meet the fate of a lot of organizations that tried to do that and quickly implode. So I, I really just, again, that was my disappointment going in, but I've learned that it's not really a disappointment in the long run. And yes, I'll, I... I'll explain a bit more about that because I'll get into this. I, I wrote down some notes and the questions y'all sent, so I don't want to get ahead of myself, but... Um, it's like, if you are into the esoteric aspect of masonry, you can find it. It ain't hard. There's a lot of people right. out there that are interested in the same thing. That The resources are out there. The groups are out there. The books are out there. Like, if you put in the effort, you will find it. And so for people who are like, oh, my lodge doesn't do education, so I'm going to quit masonry. I'm just like, fine, quit masonry. If you're so lazy that you want your life <laughs> to do this stuff, like, you know, goodbye. Like, I'll, I'll give you a wave as you leave. <laughs> that, that's harsh, but we don't exist to spoon feed this stuff to people. Like right, Mason right. Self. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. That's awesome. That's awesome. See, I would, I would be burned at the stake if I said that, but, you know, you're Robert <laughs> Park, so you get away with it. I'll, I'll let you keep talking because you're, you're making me feel good. I... <laughs> uh, so, yeah. I feel like I'm just talking to you, Dennis. I forget this is going to go out. But, yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> Again, like I said, that's how I feel today. You ask me tomorrow. <laughs> that's how I feel today. <laughs> right, right. But but those are valid. Those are valid points. And, you know, it, and it's kind of it's kind of a double edged sword, really, because you hate for a lodge to say you'll get 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 out of it what you put into it. But, but you are right that you do have to seek this stuff out and you have to be willing to travel to find what you're looking for, to find your people. And, and then it will come spoon fed to you. I mean, it'll come with shovel, you know, yes. and that's, that's the, that's the reality of it. And I, I hate to, you know, give in to a lazy lodge because really we, we should step up and, and be more well-rounded and, and, offer a little bit of of all things to give people an idea of what's available yeah. but yeah you're absolutely right absolutely With, right i agree I, i'm not advocating you know doing just being like let's just have business meetings and you can do all this crap by yourself but again i just i don't think it's the lodge's responsibility to cater to the mason i think everything is there it's already there everything mm -hmm. is there. go look for it and that's what i found and maybe I'm just, maybe I have survivor bias on that, but you know, I, I'm not that bright. And if I could do this myself, like anyone can, <laughs> I found I'd exactly say, what I was looking for in masonry and it really wasn't that hard. I'd say 20 right. years ago, um, just speaking from my perspective, it was, I think it was harder to find these things um, just because maybe it's because I was a new Mason and I didn't know where to look, but uh I, me me having certain expectations that I could not 
I could not find locally. Um, and I didn't know where to find it online was, was extremely disappointing. I think now, like you say, it's, 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 it's so much easier. Like it, you, there's so many groups, uh, so many Facebook groups, so many, so many newer books out there and resources that, yeah, I think you could, I think you could find what you're looking for. If you, if you join the lodge and it turns out to be something that's not offering what you're looking for, like you say, um, there's, there's almost certainly a lodge out there that does. I, I also think it's important. Uh, I recognize that, like you say, it's good to be somewhat amorphous, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with that. But if your lodge is really focused on on one thing, then then it's it's not going to be as receptive to to other things. For example, uh, there's a there's a local lodge that that they're huge on charity. They do a lot of fundraising and they they give a lot of money away. Which is great, but if you if you come in there and say, "Hey, I really want to start focusing on education and, and bringing that in," it's probably not going to be as well received, and, and vice versa. If you find like a like a really education focused lodge and you want to start pumping fundraisers, it's probably not going to go as well either. And so, where I'm going with this is, if you're if if that's what your lodge offers, if it's what you focus on, then be sure that that's what you're telling people when they come to your door. That way, if you have someone that's esoteric minded and he, he thinks all lodges are the same and he comes to a, a fundraiser lodge, he's not disillusioned by thinking that's that's all Freemasonry has to offer. Right. You say, hey, this is what we're about. Uh, there's other lodges that that probably offer what you're looking for. If this is something else that you want. But this is what this is what we do. And I, and I think that's fair. I, I And there are some lodges in San Antonio that do exactly that. Like when someone comes up like, hey. You might be better at this lodge just because of what you want. Good. Hey. I didn't use that marker. I didn't use that. Hey, guys. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Some lodges do that, but that's a, a well-taken point, is that you do have lodges that focus on different things. And that's why when I when I knew... Hey, guys. You got to be quiet. Sorry, my wife is already in bed. <laughs> so, there she is. <laughs> so... I, I do think that new candidates should go to a bunch of different lodges looking around and test them out. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. I tell everyone. I'm like, have you tried out these lodges? Even people that come to Alamo 44, I'm like, you really need to go to a couple different lodges and get the feel of them before you decide which one you want to petition. Yeah. Um, yeah but again, at the same time, I, it is, it does put a burden on the new Mason to go out and do this himself. Uh, all I'm saying, though, is there has to be a happy medium between us. I don't think this can be... I don't think we should put the burden on these lodges to keep these guys here. My whole opinion of masonry is we are drawn to this for a reason. Mm -hmm. Like, everyone I talked to says, I became a mason for these reasons, but also there was something that, like, drew me towards it. Yes. And it, that idea that we're coming to this of our own free will and accord, that this is a personal journey, masonry puts all the burdens on us. No one can interpret the symbols for us. We have to do that ourselves. Like everything about masonry is a personal journey. So in my mind, if you're expecting the lodge to keep people there and that somehow we blame the lodges for these failings, like, oh, if you just done this, you would have kept this guy here. If you just had more education, you would have gotten more members. I, I just think a lot of that's crap. I think if these guys are sticking around and doing the work, I think in my mind, I'm like, that's fine. Like masonry is about the personal journey and we're not going to hold your hand for it. But again, I'm kind of honorary tonight after a long week at work. So, again, that just... <laughs> yeah. so if anyone's upset no, about what brother Park says, he might feel differently tomorrow. So, so don't hold it against him. <laughs> no, that that's uh those are valid, valid thoughts. And, yeah. and, you know, we, I've often thought that, that, Justin and I, and I will get on a tangent sometimes and go one direction or another on on different topics, and and then we reel ourselves in and and then go a different direction, and 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 that's because <laughs> that's because there is so many different directions, really. Well, and, Dennis, and it is a personal journey. On your show, I need to say you know something you know that is entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well. We've been dancing around this all night, in my opinion. I, I've been, I've noticed different tidbits um, all night. So, um, what do you think the strengths and weaknesses are in our fraternity? But I think that you touched on a lot of them, really. 
Um, well, let, let me if you, uh, could, if you could pinpoint them. There's one that I didn't touch on, and it's one that I was. Th I talk about this one quite a bit. It, it's a. It's not the only one, but it's one that comes up when I think about like what. What are the real strengths of masonry? And uh, I always talk about masonry's integrative effect. And what I mean by that, it's, it's very rare outside of being in school or the military to get a bunch of people from different backgrounds and beliefs and education and politics, all this stuff together in one group that's working together. You know, we tend to isolate ourselves in our personal lives from people who are different than us, you know, whether that's religion or whatever. But this leads to many issues. Like we... We are always defining ourselves by how we are different than other groups or other people. It could be our religion, our political beliefs, our race, our jobs, like whatever it is. You know, masonry is one of the only organizations that I know that defines itself by how we are all the same. Like even though we all have these differences, there's a core set of beliefs that we share that transcend all these distinctions. And whether masons know it or not, doing that is an incredibly beneficial effect. Like getting all these people together, Having them be brothers and working together is a is a huge deal. It allows us to get to know and respect people that we would never hang out with or talk to in our normal lives. Then once we respect them, we learn that they have different beliefs than we do, and it leads in some instances to cognitive dissonance. Basically, it forces us to reevaluate our own beliefs and what we think of yes. other people. Because now we know this guy. It's like, oh, I thought you know, these types of people were X. But now I know this guy, and this guy is a great friend. He's a great brother. So maybe I was wrong. Like maybe my viewpoints on this stuff was wrong. And I, I can't stress like how important that is. Like what an important part of masonry that is. Yeah. And that's not again. That's not the only one. I can go into all the esoteric stuff and all the other stuff. But that is a a core strength that I don't think it's talked about enough. I think the exclusion of conversations about uh, politics and religion go a long way in that aspect because those are two things that that generally if you know someone is a, an opposing political party or or certain religions then you kind of have a mental image already of what that person's like uh so if you have that information up front you kind of go in there with these preconceived notions but uh if you if you get to know somebody without all that in front of you and realize you know actually actually meet the person and learn it, be, it become friends with that person. Um, and then later you're like, oh, that, that guy has different religion or that guy is a Republican or a Democrat or whatever. You already you already love that guy as a brother, yes. regardless of, of the affiliation. And so, and I, and I know I know Dennis kind of feels differently about talking politics and stuff at Lodge, but I think, I think having that not on the forefront goes go so far in regards to what you're talking about. And I, it happened to me personally. Like, I, I will tell you, this this hit me pretty hard because, you know, Ron was my first Masonic, Masonic mentor, but like many guys, uh, Chris Williams and Brad Kohanke were my, my second group of Masonic mentors. And I got to know Brad Kohanke very well and um, think he's one of the, um, the best Masons I know. Mm -hmm. And um, I learned that he shared some very different political beliefs than I did. And <laughs> reevaluate my own view on things. And it was very helpful from a personal standpoint, but that, that exactly happened to me. And so I know that it works. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I would like to add to that. You know, I agree it works. And to be honest, I'm not so afraid to talk about those things with, with brothers and, Maybe I ought to wait a little bit longer before I talk to people, but I actually draw closer to people through that discussion and debate because I, I know that they're speaking their heart. I'm speaking my heart. And it, somewhere in the midst of it, we're both challenging each other to become better and think about more than just ourselves and our own beliefs. And, and I, I actually love that aspect of the debate. <laughs> It's for me. It's not just being right. It's 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 the joy of debate. It really well, is. Talk together, Dennis. Like I like to uh, I like to argue just for the sake of argument and uh, fun. And I, I never get offended. But you know you can't do that with everybody. Yes. <laughs> I know. <Yes. laughs> yeah. For for an organization that puts an emphasis on rhetoric, we uh, we're not very good at rhetoric, are we? Well, let me. Um, you also asked about weaknesses. 
Um, well, I, again, from what I have personally seen, we have a lot of the same weaknesses as any other organization. I mean, I've seen petty fights for power at all levels. I've seen political wrangling. I've seen idealistic clashes, lust for titles, um, you know, for recognition, all this stuff. Like, I see it, but, you know, that's kind of unavoidable. Like, every organization has that. Like, even one like ours, where we're supposed to be above that stuff, it happens. Like, the further up you go in an organization, you get that stuff. Yep. Um, you know, also not having a common dogma or set of beliefs. You know, I said that was a good thing. It is a good thing. But it can also lead to fights over what is Masonic or what our symbols mean. And, you know, some people want to impose their view of that on other people, even though they shouldn't. And again, we have some that go through the grand chairs, people at Great Lodge who believe that, you know, masonry is this way. And I'm going to impose what I think masonry is on the rest of masonry instead of letting masons figure it out for themselves. I'm not saying we shouldn't have, you know, these you know, landmarks. We, we have these core things that we believe in, but in my mind, the purpose of masonry is to basically let, it's a federal system, but we're supposed to be letting these subordinate lodges and the individual masons kind of figure this stuff out for themselves within the bounds that Grand Lodge sets for it. And, you know, one of the issues I've seen too is that, you know, a federal system works the best when the lodges are active and informed, you know, but when that's not the case and you have a lot of lodges that are small or like, I've just seen that a lot of the power that used to be with the subordinate lodges, if they're not going to exercise it, you know, it'll get, it'll go to Grand Lodge, just like in yes. our country, you know, you have this creep of federal power that happens over time and you have the centralized power becoming, you know, more powerful than was originally intended. And I think that, you know, in Masonry, that's probably not a great thing. You know, we should keep the majority of the power with the subordinate lodges. I, I remember seeing That's the, way the Grand West does run the show. Mm -hmm. The lodges, the past masters are the ones that have the power during vacation. You know, the, the Grand Master and the Grand Officers, they they have the authority to act for the Grand West. But the Grand West, when in session, they have the ultimate authority. You can look at the old minutes of pretty much any, any lodge that's been around for 100 years or so. And if you read the minutes, I mean, there used to be Masonic trials locally, things like that. There was that's a lot exactly, more control. That's exactly what I was thinking of. Because it used to be when these lodges were able to, all Masonic disciplinary you know, actions were done within the lodge. Mm -hmm. Like, the, bring it, you know, it would go up and the Grand Master would have to do his thing, but it would be tried in the lodge. The lodge would use their members as jury. Like, all this stuff would be happening. Like, yeah, I go back and read uh, minutes from Alamo Lodge. We had trials, like, every month, it seemed like. Like for ridiculous things, like this guy yeah, spit. So yeah. petty, yeah. Soon, or this guy said a bad word outside a lodge. You know, we're going to have a trial on that. But it, it was very robust and happened like every month. And what happened was, as time went on, a lot of lodges just couldn't do that. They couldn't feel the jury. They didn't know how these trials worked. Title V, you know, has never been easy to understand. But you know, it's a, uh, it's pretty convoluted for a non-lawyer. And so. Back out of necessity, the Grand Lodge had to be, you know, getting more and more involved in these disciplinary actions until where now, basically, it is a, you know, for all intents and purposes, it's done by the Grand Lodge and not the subordinate lodges. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Like, all things are consolidating into the central power uh, because we don't have strong lodges. And, I, you know, I won't mince right. words. We just don't. Uh, that's the issue. You right. also mentioned uh, certain dogmas, and it made me remember, maybe it was three years ago, four years ago at Grand Lodge, there was a resolution that it basically, the gist of it was that no education could be read in Lodge unless it was went through the proper committees at <laughs> Grand Lodge first. And <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I still cringe <laughs> thinking about that, but uh, someone someone thought it was a good idea somewhere. And I don't mean to be insulting, but that's, that's exactly what you're talking about, about people being dogmatic. And not liking, not liking certain ideas. Yeah, well, I was senior deacon last night and got in trouble for putting the ribbon in the wrong place. Yeah. What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> it used to not be there. It used to be at the top. It wasn't on the side. I don't know. I don't know. And again, that's you know, some lodges. You know, we give some presentations that you know it, it'll go over very well at certain lodges. At certain lodges, they'll just be staring at you. In other lodges, they'll be running you out of the room. Mm -hmm. And, you know, prerogative. It's like, you know, if y'all don't like it, you don't have to believe what you know we're saying or even like it. 
uh, we just have to be able to say it. And, you know, that, that's how I feel about it. As long as we're complying with the ancient landmarks and these core ideas, there should be a lot of room to uh, interpret these symbols. Yes, yes. And, and you know, that's one of the things, what you're describing to me is one of the things I've been thinking of a lot lately and, and putting out there is, is we've got to get back to a common vision. We've lost our vision within Freemasonry. And it, you know, we can't get into the dogmas and what what Freemasonry actually has to be for any particular person. But as a Grand Lodge and as, you know, the support uh, the Grand West, we need a vision to wrap our ourselves around and to, and to get the buy-in so that we can get reunited. But it's so hard. that Dennis, I've been thinking about that. <laughs> I'm sure you know, we go to all the same organizations and we hear a lot of the same speeches. And I've been around Masonry, not for as long as some people, but for over a decade. And I've heard plenty of Masonic talks and I've read plenty of Masonic history. And it makes me laugh because you'll read speeches that were written 100 years ago, 150 years ago. And they could have been spoken today in one of our lodges. It's like, you know, we need to bring back education. We need to make our degrees mean something again. We need to get organized. Like, you sh read Pike, like, when he, you know, in the fourth degree, when he's like, yeah, if you went through the first three degrees and weren't impressed, you're not alone. Like, Masonry's lost <laughs> a lot of Like, he was saying that back then. Like, <laughs> that, that's yes. my problem. We keep saying this, like, you know, we need to do these certain things. And it gets me thinking, like, do we really? Like, I, I hear, com you know, people complain, like I said, we don't have enough education. Oh, our meetings are too long. No one wants to sit through the minutes or talk about the fish fry. You know, we're running young people away with this stuff. Or, you know, our degrees, if we just did them better, we'd get them back. I just, I don't agree. Like I said, Masonic writers have been making these complaints from the dawn of Masonry. And this goes back to what I said earlier. All the information is there. It just requires personal effort. You know, if you think the lodge is supposed to hold your hand, you're in the wrong organization. Mm -hmm. So I really don't think that's a weakness. And I don't think we could actually do that if we wanted to. Because like I said, masonry is so many different things. And as long as you're abiding by like these core set of beliefs, like there's no way to wrangle all these people or all the things they think masonry should be because we can't say they're wrong. Like you can't tell this guy, oh, your view of masonry is wrong. You just want to sit around lodge and you know, talk about fish fries, you know, but yeah, that he has a correct view of masonry. This guy over here, you know, wants to talk about, you know, tarot cards and like, you know, that kind of stuff. I'm like, well, he's right about masonry too. Like the, there is no way we can combine all this stuff into one coherent whole without cutting people off, without making it into a dogmatic system. I and think I, I've come to the conclusion that's just, that is how masonry is. And there is nothing we can do about it because it doesn't need to be fixed. <laughs> you could you could probably create, just my opinion, you could probably create a common mission and vision statement for a lodge. Yes. Uh, but when you start looking at maybe like, hey, let's have a district mission. Or when you say or a statewide mission, uh, statewide would be impossible. I mean, just just flat out like like you're saying, like, Having having a common goal across the state of Texas when you have so many different opinions, um, just is it's just not going to happen. Well, it's, if you look at our and I, I'm not I am not bad mouthing. I love all our grandmasters, but it makes me laugh when you look at their mission statements for their years. It's always something very general, like oh, it's brotherhood, oh, it's virtue, or it's this stuff. Like their goal is something that you know, if you keep it general enough, yeah, you can do something like that. <laughs> but if you're if you're setting something very specific as far as a policy, like masonry is going to do this, and this is what masonry should be doing, like that's where you run into the problems to me because you can't yeah. really. No. And the more the more general you are, the again, I'm not bad mouthing anybody either, but the more general your goals are, the easier it is to uh, say you're successful. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, where do you see our current course taking us in the next 10, 20, or 30 years? God, I'm, I'm just going to be talking about the same things over and over again, but I, <laughs> I honestly don't know. This is something else I'm sure everyone who's listening has heard a speech about this within the past you know, couple of years. It's the doom and gloom about membership. It's like, oh, we had all these members after World War II, and then it's just dying off, and 
no one wants to join masonry and have you read bowling alone like you know no one's joining civic organizations <laughs> <laughs> all this crap it really doesn't bother me though and you know the main reason it bothers some people i found is you know number one we have all these buildings we have all these programs that need money to exist and they mm -hmm. were our membership was much higher like for instance you know i'm the chairman of the scottish rite cathedral in san antonio and I love that building. Like, I love that building. And we are working very hard to keep that building and to get it back into its former glory. You know, but the problem is we have made these buildings and institutions like albatrosses around our neck. And it's like, you know, again, you know, institutions should exist for men. Men shouldn't exist for institutions. It's like these buildings should exist for masonry. We don't exist for these buildings. Like, we don't exist for these things that we did back when our membership was huge. So I, I really don't, if they have to go, they have to go. That's not what masonry is about. And if people think we need these flashy buildings and all this stuff to be masons, I just don't agree with that. Um, you know, we shouldn't be slaves to the buildings. Mm -hmm. You know, when it comes to community impact, you know, people are worried too, if we get smaller, we won't have the same, you know, impact we had in society. We won't have the same impact in the community. But I guarantee you a small group of actual dedicated people can make just as much an impact or more as a large group of apathetic people. And again, I'm just, I'm not worried about it because if we had our membership declined even more, but we had people who were actually out there and working and like trying to do this stuff, I, I don't think it would be an issue. So again, I just, I don't care about the decline in our membership. Everyone seems to care about that. I just don't care. So we might get smaller. We might stay the same size we are, you know, I think the more pressing issue is what are we actually doing to help our communities and the world at large? Again, as a Scottish Rite guy, when you read Pike, you know, he calls us, you know, knights, and he's not using that symbolically. Like, Pike really believed that Masons should be actively fighting to make the world a better place, or that we should be exemplars so that the world at large is finally convinced of our good effect. And, you know, I don't think anyone takes these obligations seriously or as seriously as they should. So I don't think we're even close to that yet. So while we're complaining about membership, I think we should be really worried about what are we actually doing to, to actually live the Masonic ideals. You know, our community involvement has declined. And honestly, if a lot of the profane could actually see how we operate and treat each other sometimes, I don't think they'd be very impressed. Like, I think we should be exemplars for these people. And we're not doing a good job with it. Mm -hmm. So that's where I see ourselves. I, I don't... There are more young people coming in. I've noticed that. I don't know if the trends are changing completely, but I think we're going to get smaller. I just hope that we can get better at doing actual masonry. And that's what I'm trying to do. Can you confirm what do you mean when you say community involvement? Like, what are you, what are you thinking? What's in your mind when you say that? Yeah, that's a good question, too. I'm not talking about getting out there and doing charitable work. You. We do a lot of that. Now, I'm not, I'm not, saying that our, our hospitals and our charities aren't doing good work. I'm talking about like individual Masons. Like what are we doing in our lodges? What are we doing in the Scottish Rite to actually help the community around us? I'll, I'll give you an example. I went to a Prince Hall event. Um, it was one of their balls they had in San Antonio where they were um, giving away all their charitable money. Like they gave away more money in one night than I've seen all the lodges in San Antonio give away my, in my entire Masonic career. They had their churches up there. They had their community centers up there. They had all these people coming up and talking about what an impact that these groups have had on them. Like they had kids coming up saying, you know, I, you know, I was able to do this thanks to these Masonic lodges. You know, they helped wow. me out. It was incredible. Like I went there with one of my good friends who's a Mason and we were just like, we were like, holy crap. Like, this is very impressive. Mm -hmm. Like, do some stuff. We, we have a very good program at my lodge where we do scholarships to St. Philip's College. And a lot of other lodges in San Antonio do that as well. But um, that's one of the things I'm talking about. Like, again, with the Scottish Rite, we used to, back in the day, they used to have events there for the community. Like, they'd have debates there. They'd have people come and give, you know, I would say, like, kind of TED Talks type of things. But, like professors, like scientists, come in and give these things for the public, it'd be like the Scottish Rite is presenting this talk for the general public because the Scottish Rite's mission is education. Like, that's the stuff I'm talking about. And then also in your personal life, like, I want people to look at Masons and be like, God damn, 
that is a good guy. And then when they figure out he's a Mason, they're like, wow. So they, you know, we are showing the world that we are doing something good. Like I want us to be, again, I'm going off on a rant here, but I want us to be good fathers, good husbands. I want us to be good employees, good bosses. Like we should be doing all this stuff. Cause that's, again, when you read Pike, it's like, here is, you are supposed to be protecting these things. You're supposed to be a pinnacle of virtue. You're supposed to be helping the unfortunate. You're supposed to be doing all these things. It's rough and it takes a lot of effort. And, but that is what masonry is all about. And so again, I'm not perfect. People listen to me probably think, Oh, well, holy shit. Like you're holier than now, but I have a long ways to go on all of this. Stuff. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to get you to the choir here. <laughs> I'd like to circle back to the, the liability of the buildings the asset liabilities that we have, because if we didn't have those, we would have more available time and effort and energy to put into those things. And I wish more people would realize that. I, I, you know what I would love is for all the lodges in every major city that has like a temple, um, even if it's, you know, the, the uh, Fort Worth temple, you know, even though they're heavily, you know, commandery and all, but, have one big building and all the lodges meet in that one building save the resources everybody contribute you've always got something going on there to where you can attend whenever you're in town there's something going on and it's all right there and then you also have more resources from those instead of putting all that money into these you know old you know well most of them are just 1950s buildings that are square you know, architecture, the, that bland garbage that, you know, nobody likes anyways. Yeah. Get rid of all that. Have a fat bank account and, and be able to pay a decent rent to, to a big cathedral or contribute to a big cathedral and everybody, you know, mesh it up and, and do exactly <laughs> that. And then with those, with those, resources of of different people as well you also have the the resources of touching that senator or that or that council member or you know that 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 church clergy that wants to you know give a presentation yeah. on on you know theology or something in your cathedral you know that you Pride. you just had answer right there you, you gave it ego. to us We've been going the opposite direction, though. Here, I mean, yeah. that's the whole. We've been, yeah. Everyone wants their own building. Everyone wants their own place. Yeah, that that is an issue. I mean, I'm a proponent of lodges consolidating, which will get me hung in certain quarters. But I, I think right. that's a, yeah. Uh, I think lodges should be strong. I think there shouldn't be more of them than necessary. And Dennis, I agree with you. I think that, you know, we used to have that Masonic temple in San Antonio. You know, that was kind of like, you know, where everyone met. The Scottish right, you know, we have a lot of people meeting there, but you know, everyone wants to, everyone wants their own thing, and uh, that's fine. But I, I agree with you. I think, um, you know, if you can consolidate and just get have a nice bank account and just worry about masonry and not the building, uh, I guess that's what I would say. We, we yes. have the largest Masonic lodge in in my district in sixty two, and uh, we reached out to the lodge, the other lodges, two years ago saying hey we're not asking you to sell your building or anything but we'll, we'll give you a really cheap rate if you want to not merge with us but meet in our lodge like you still you just cut off your utilities for a year or two save up the money and, and just meet at our lodge building and then you can use that excessive that excess funds that you're that you're making from not paying utilities and stuff to to build up your bank account or to give back the community or something like that and, and, and no one took up on the uh, up up on up on that offer, and I think that's what you run into. Like yeah. you said, like like the ego, the pride, it, it's it's very strong. And unfortunately, what usually happens is that ego and pride remain strong until it's at that point where that lodge has to merge or it has to demise. But I I really like what you're talking about. Um, you see a lot of lodges do scholarships. And I think Dennis and I, we talked about this on our last live, I think, and that like $500 scholarship, $1,000 scholarship, that doesn't go far anymore. But $500 to a, uh, like a, uh, like a youth association or, or some kind of 
something like that, something small, uh, that will go really far. But well, I think I was, um, I didn't express one part of that as good as I probably should have. All that stuff is good. Uh, and I don't know how to say this without, well, you know, again, I, I was really into the esoteric aspect of masonry. And a lot of people who are, and I know a lot of intellectual masons, and, but what I have learned, this is a personal thing that I've learned. You can study the symbolism and study the mystical aspects of masonry all you want. If it doesn't lead to any actual changes in how you treat other people and how you view the world, it's basically intellectual masturbation. Like, th that's the whole... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> we forget one of the first lessons having to do with unheard mortar, basically. And uh, that, that's my problem. There, are, You see a lot of self-styled adepts, mm -hmm. and you watch the way they treat other people or treat other Masons, and you just shake your head. Even amongst our fraternity... There are so many people that you know are so well respected and have such power, but when you watch the way they treat other masons or people beneath them, you're just like, did you learn any of the ethnic lessons from the three degrees? Like seriously, yes. like you you might be able to cite Masonic history, but what did you really learn? Like, right. and that's that's what I'm talking about. I've I've seen brothers, and I use that term loosely, that have been in for many decades, and some of which have have done a lot of things in the fraternity and at the end of the day they're they are they don't act masonic at all like you're talking about i'll put that's a nice way of putting it they they and I, i've said the exact almost the exact same thing as you where it's it's a, it's as though they went through all the degrees learned all the work and and memorized what they had to memorize but they never learned a damn thing well that's the thing people tend to sneer at like these simple lessons of the degrees they're like, oh my God, I, you know, I know all that. Where are the real secrets? You know, where's the real mystery? I don't need this, this crap. I already know all this crap, you know. But again, you know, the you end up finding that those simple lessons taught in degrees are actually a hell of a lot more important and a hell of a lot more difficult to put into practice than a lot of these other things. Mm -hmm. And you come around that it's a big circle. Like you start and you do all this searching and journeying, and you come right back to the EA degree. You're like, holy hell! Like you know, I totally. I didn't understand anything this was trying to teach me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The way I kind of see it is, is you, you do that full circle, but it's, it ends up being more like a spiral. So you come back to your original point and then you do it again and then you do it again and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller to where eventually you hit the dot. You're, you're there. You finally made it and then you die. <laughs> I'll bring up some tarot. Since <laughs> that reminds me. Please. Like Everyone's familiar with the card, the tower. One of the things that stands for is that that is the reality that we construct for ourselves. That we, we construct this false view of the world that has to be destroyed every now and then to make way for a more accurate view of the world. But the thing is, we can't view the world except through a tower. So we will rebuild that tower every time. We might get it a little more accurate each time we build it, but it's never going to be 100% accurate. So our tower is going to be destroyed every time we build it. It's just every time we come back to it, we're doing it a little bit better. And yeah. I think that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I love interesting. That. Interesting. I, I there's some degrees that, that fall along that line, don't they? Yes. Man. <laughs> that's right. Perfection is attained through degrees, step by step. <laughs> yes, I have, uh, absolutely. I have one more question, but uh, before we go into that, I do want to point out I usually have a really hard time coming up with a good title. And uh, but you gave me the title. You gave me the perfect title for this video. It's a uh, intellectual masturbation with Brother Robert <laughs> Park. <laughs> that is awesome. Oh my god! No. Um, the next question, uh, Dennis, did you want to take this? I think I took the last question actually. Um. Well, again, we've we've been talking about this so much. It's it's uh. Going back to our weaknesses, how how would you correct them? And and I think you've answered that ten times over. I don't think we have any weaknesses. <laughs> <laughs> Again, what I mean by that is masonry is masonry. Like the, the masonry, what I'm talking about, like the core parts, the philosophy, the history, that is there. the The belief system is there. The symbols are there. Of course, we have organizational issues. We have political issues. We have personality issues. We have cultural issues. We have issues with recruiting. 
These are all the things you hear about ad nauseum. And we will always have these things. Again, there is no way to prevent these things. They can be ameliorated. They can never be, you know, you can't get rid of these things. People are people. <laughs> this is what happens in an organization. But masonry, you know, what I'm talking about, exists for particular people. Like I said, we are all drawn to this thing. You can't force someone to like masonry or someone to study masonry, but it's all there. It's there, and like-minded people are out there, and you have to look for them and put in some effort. But I don't think there's any weakness in the Masonic system. Like, and that's what I'm talking about. Again, maybe our organization, maybe our laws, but not in the Masonic system itself. I think it works very well. It's worked very well for a long time. I think it's serving its purpose for those who actually want to put in the effort and do it. And there's nothing I would change about it. <laughs> I, I tend to agree. And, and I think that's where a lot of people mistake me a lot is I'm talking about organizational things sometimes on what we need to correct in, in to, to move forward. And, and people take it personal that I'm dogging on Freemasonry in general. And, yes. and that's that's definitely not yeah. not the case because it's it's my uh, you know that's that's uh, that's my heart and soul of life. If if yeah. I didn't have that, I would I don't know what I would have. It's we can talk about it. yeah we can critique the outer garments of masonry, which is you know our grand lodge and the laws and the system and all that. Yeah you know, yeah you know, we can you know, we try to improve that. We can bitch about it all this stuff. But again, I don't think that the actual underlying masonry. Yeah, I don't think there's anything there that needs to be fixed. I think any mm -hmm. try to tinker with it, you just mess it up. <laughs> I'm reminded right. of a saying. Uh, vaguely, it goes: uh, Freemasonry is perfect. Is the people that are not. That yeah. is, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that's that's very accurate. Like as a as 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 a whatever you want to whatever you really want to label Freemasonry, it, it's perfect at what it does. It's perfect in it, it's. Like it's it's very idealistic, but it's perfect in that way. But it's once once people start getting involved, they, they start getting messed up. That's right. But again, you know, I, I go back to this: the fact that we don't have a dogma or system of beliefs beyond like these core, you know, these core things you have to follow has rel it causes us, you know, all this frustration about like, well, what does this mean? Like, what should we be doing? But again, that's what keeps us, that's what's so perfect about it. It keeps us from imploding like some other organizations. It keeps us from constricting thought. It keeps masonry uh, existing for all types of people that find value in it. And uh, again, that's why I love it. It's just, it's, it's very bizarre. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre that you can't put your finger on what it is, but that is what makes it so great. <laughs> I love it. Yes. Um, what's interesting to, to me is, is when you do have a presentation or whatever, or you're talking on a subject and, uh, and people want to know your reference. Well, th these are my thoughts. Man. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what you God to spoke do, to me. <laughs> what you need to do is just uh, put your own thoughts like on the PowerPoint and then put Albert Pike at the bottom and no one's ever going to fact check you. You just say, look, <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right oh my there you gosh. go there you go it's awesome just yeah it's, it's page 667 just go just go look it up no one will ever do it yeah <laughs> i like that uh so i think at this time it's it's probably good just to go ahead and and uh make the announcement uh dennis do you want to announce who our next speaker is going to be well brothers you know all master masons that are 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 into this discussion and and uh, feel the same way as we do, you will have your opportunity to have this great debate with Brother Robert Park down at the Masonic Improvement Summit in Corpus Christi, Texas on September 16th. And not only will you get to hear him speak um, about things like this and, and the mysteries as well that, that brought him to these conclusions, but... You'll also have a chance to sit down and, and have a drink with him afterwards, either on the beach or next to the beach, depending on how humid it is. I, I may be inside, but <laughs> we'll all get together afterwards and, and uh, chew on all this kind of stuff uh, afterwards. And, and we are so proud and so excited that you're coming down. Well, I'm very ha I'm excited, too. I'm, I'm very excited to come down here. I'm actually working on 
new presentation for this that should be at least as divisive as what I've said tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <Nice>. Wonderful. <laughs> Because that's that's what we as as leaders crave, right? And that's what this is all about. It's it's about improving ourselves as leaders and and making us think outside of the box and and uh, and being challenged. And that's exactly why I wanted you here. There there is not one person I know that has not been challenged by your thoughts at some point or another. Anybody that's listened to you. <laughs> well, I really the opportunity yeah it's gonna be a lot of fun <laughs> yeah we're I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it it's gonna be great yes i think after people hear this podcast they're gonna they're gonna be all in they're gonna be wishing there were <laughs> tickets left <laughs> <laughs> we touched on we touched on a lot of different things and he said just enough to get people angry but not really <laughs> go into it too much so like, i'm gonna go and tell them what i think <laughs> but the but the beauty is is park is is well respected enough that they don't get angry like they get angry with me so they, <laughs> they get angry but they're angry with themselves because they can't be angry with him <laughs> just a reminder the opinions of the host and, and guests on this uh, podcast do not represent those of any lodge or any grand lodge that's right that's right <laughs> uh brother park do you have any uh final thoughts as we as we wrap this up um, I do not. My final thought is it's been a long week and this was a great talk and I'm going to go get a glass of wine after this. <laughs> nice. Yes. Yes, I agree. But I, I got to tell you guys, I, I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. And yeah, thank you for putting up with my scheduling snafu snafus. I really appreciate it. It's understandable. It was well worth it. it really yes, definitely. <laughs> Dennis, what are your final thoughts? Well, you know, and going back to all of it um you know that's that's really why we're here on the sonic improvement because people don't feel like they fit in and you know we've got so texas is so big and our country is so big and the world is so big people get into freemasonry and they can't find their niche within their lodge and you know we're we're trying to to let people know they're not alone and it's okay to travel. It's okay to learn something. It's okay to to uh, challenge yourself and others. You know, find your people. And if you can't find your people alone, let us know, and and we'll help you find your people. I don't care if it's charity people. I'll send you to Sam Gibbons. But if it's but if it's <laughs> if it's you know esoteric or, or you know the the uh, even the nuts and bolts of Freemasonry, I'll then you to OLT. But when it comes to esoteric work and uh, the mystery schools, you know, I'm always going to send you to Scottish Rite and and uh, and uh, Robert Park, Bradley Kohanke, Chris Williams, all my favorite people, all of my people. But anyways, um, that's what we're here for. And and that's why we're putting on the summit. We're so fortunate to have have friends that that just answered the call, just answered it, just said, yeah, I'm in. I'm there for you. Yeah. And and we're grateful. I'll say that I, I think anyone who's been listening to the show for a while um, probably has a pretty good idea if we haven't just come out and say it. Uh, Dennis and I are, are pretty pro-education in, in, in the Lodge. Like we're, we're into the esoterics. We think education is important. But that doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, like Brother Park is saying, uh, you can't really one size fit all with, with all Lodges. That said, I think there are – so a large can have a different focus, but I think personally that there are different things that are beneficial, certain practices that are beneficial for every lodge, um, such as maybe like like longer waiting periods, getting to know the candidates before they turn into their petitions, things like that. Um, for the reasons that were actually mentioned here, um, we ought to be sure that this guy's a good fit for your lodge. Um, as, as well as like organizational practices and things like that. Many of these things which will be talked about at at the summit. And so don't don't feel as though that means don't feel as though that you want to focus more on charity or that you want to focus more on doing like brotherly stuff outside the lodge or that you think education is more important or the esoteric aspect. Don't feel as though you you really want to focus on one thing that certain practices still would not be beneficial to your lodge. And 
uh, I'm not suggesting that you could bring every best practice into your lodge at once, but um, I don't know. I was just, I, I, I really enjoyed this conversation because it really, it really focuses on something that me and Dennis don't talk about a whole lot. And that, that Freemasonry uh, is flexible, right? There, there are different aspects to the fraternity. And just because I'm not huge on charity doesn't mean I hate on the lodge that it is. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I won't direct people to that if that's what they want. But um, we could we could be accepting of other of other thought processes and recognize that there are other ways people could practice their Freemasonry without feeling as though we are being dogmatic about it. I agree with that. Yes. Awesome. And you hit on something. That, uh, I know we already had last thoughts, but you hit on something. That was <laughs> small point, but I see it quite a bit, and it's it's a disturbing trend. When you do have a lodge that is struggling, um, they are more likely to admit members just for dues and to not go through the proper vetting process. And when you have aggregate, it causes huge problems. So I do think that's another to go towards get these lodges <laughs> position yes yes yeah, yeah when a, i go ahead unless it's certain lodges that i know do certain things when i hear of lodges doing a lot of degrees i'm thinking oh my god what's going on <laughs> Who, who's coming in <laughs> yeah yeah and that, that's why, and like I said, I know we all said final thoughts, but this is something that Dennis and I are pretty strong about. If you let someone in your door as soon as they bring a petition or as soon as they express an interest and you give them a petition that day, like I've seen lodges where the guy walks in, he gets a petition and he has the signatures before he leaves that day. I have and, too. And you know nothing about that guy. You know nothing about really what he expects or his personality or anything like that. Sure, there's an investigation <laughs> process. But we need to we need to nip that in the you you can't really properly investigate somebody if you've only known them less than a month, and that's Agreed. usually what happens. He gets a petition; they want to vote on him before the next steady meeting. You have at the most four weeks usually. Investigate this guy in four weeks. Go, you know, bring him to the lodge. Everybody sit at the table and talk to him fifteen minutes, and he's he's good. And that that's no way that's no way to bring people into fraternity because you don't really know what they're expecting. You don't really know much about the person. And even if they're family. Even if they're family. All right. Well, I know that you want your wine and, and uh, it's been a it's been a long day for me as well. Thank you so much for coming on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Justin, for uh, for uh, sending out the link mm -hmm. so that we can get this thing in the books. Well, thank you again. And uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you at the summit, Robert, Brother Park. Thank and uh for everyone else, I'll uh, see you on the next video. Keep it between Good. the points, brothers. <laughs>